Hello, today we're going to talk about measurements, significant figures, and scale. If you're looking at your desk right now, what can you see? Maybe you see a pen or a pencil. Maybe you can see the light above you. It may be flickering, hopefully not. Uh, maybe you can see your computer monitor and a keyboard. All right. What else can you see? Fingerprints? Some dust? What about a bacteria? Can you see any bacteria that's lying on your keyboard? Why not? What if I were to ask you to pull out a ruler and measure your keyboard, measure your screen? What if I were to ask you the same question? Can you use it to measure the bacteria that's on your desk? Why not? Whenever you've got the bacteria that's on your desk, it's not of the same order of magnitude as the thing you're using to measure. In this case, the ruler. If they're not the same size, then what's the point in using your ruler to measure the bacteria? You can say, oh, well, it's smaller than a centimeter, all right, but how much smaller? In order to truly measure the bacteria, you'd have to use something much more small than a ruler. You'd probably have to use a microscope, a microscope with a ruler built in. So today we're going to talk about how we're going to think about measurements and how they relate to scale, um, but also what makes a measurement important. All right. So before we begin, let's look at this YouTube video that's on the scale of the universe. What this video does is it takes us through a scale, dimensions. If we notice down here in the bottom right hand corner, we have scale. What that's showing you is exponential powers. Notice right now that it's a negative exponent. So that negative exponent means that our size is getting smaller and smaller. Right? A little bit ago, just a couple minutes, a couple seconds, we were able to see the human. And now everything's getting smaller. We can see DNA, phospholipids, an atom, water molecules. Everything's getting smaller and smaller. We exited the part of the spectrum a long time ago that we can measure with a ruler. Now we're at femtometer scale a nucleus. What's the smallest thing you've ever seen? We're a lot smaller than that. Even right now, these links have never been confirmed. Now, when we're zooming back out, we're going to quickly go back to looking at our macro scale. Okay? The size that we're used to measuring. You've got the hummingbird, the teapot. What I want you to do is now we're going to zoom back out because we just zoomed in and looked at things smaller. Look and see how long you can keep the human in scale. I can still see it. Still see it. Now it's just a speck. And that's not even that far zoomed out. We're only at 10 to the third power. Notice in that bottom right hand corner those exponents. Those are all positive now. Now we're at planet. But even then, they're going to start to look small very soon. We're starting to get toward galaxies. And there's our Milky Way galaxy that we exist in. And it just disappeared. We're now at 10 to the 23rd power. And it's just getting smaller and smaller. And that's the estimated size of the universe. After watching that, did you feel big? Maybe compared to the atom, compared to DNA, or did it make you feel small? 
all of these things just matters is your perspective and how you're looking comparing the scale that you're working within. All right, so if you've got positive exponents, that's when everything's getting bigger and bigger. All right, those are the sizes that are larger than us. Whereas when you've got the negative exponents, that's when you're shrinking down in size. You're looking at really microscopic, sub-microscopic particles and, and things. So when you're thinking about measurements, what you want to think about is what scale, what order of magnitude is the thing you're measuring existing in? Would you want to measure it on the same scale as us? Would you want to measure it on the same scale as a galaxy? Or would you want to measure it on the same scale as a nucleus? All right. Another thing we have to keep in mind when we're talking about scale is how in the world are we measuring it? Okay, so for instance, if you were to go for a jog, you might use something such as RunKeeper, which is what an app on your phone or on a phone that you can see here. So RunKeeper, the way it works is it uses GPS to measure your position, and it can then relate your position to not only time, but also distance. All right, it works well because you're using, you're only tracking big distances. If you were to just move slightly, RunKeeper would not be very good just to measure, you know, you walking around in the kitchen, but it works great if you're going for a couple miles. Okay, so if we keep in mind the idea that you've got to have a number, okay, so maybe a couple, one, two, three, and then a mile, that's your unit, all right? But you used a system that's on the same scale as what you're trying to measure, all right? So this brings us to the thought that all good measurements must have a number and a unit. Well, what in the world do I mean by that? All right, let's say, if I were to give you directions for my house to Austin P, I could say any of the following. I live 36 from school. Okay. I live 47 from school. Hmm. Okay. I live 58 from school. Wow, what in the world is she talking about? What if I were to tell you all three of those statements are true? Sort of. For instance, I live 35.9718328 miles from school, or 47.87215 minutes from school, or I live 57.8 kilometers from school. So all of them are correct, but how correct are they? Which one would you use? Or you could use the last one, it takes about 50 minutes to get to school, okay? So notice, with the first three, I live 36, I live 47, and I live 58, those are not helpful because they are missing a unit. Mm -hmm. So these are all missing units. Because they're missing units, that makes them not helpful, all right? Do I live 36 minutes from school, 36 miles, 36 kilometers? What is it trying to say? Okay, so you have to make sure you include, yes, the, the number, but also the units. All right, then if we were to look a little bit further at these next three, I live 35.9718328 miles from school. How many of you guys have ever tried to come up with a random number like that? How helpful is it? Meaning, if you say I live 35.9718328, did you really live that close to school to the T? Were you able to measure that out exactly? I don't know about you, but my car speedometer does not go that exactly. So to report that many digits just seems kind of silly, okay? Same thing with I live 47.87215, okay? Way too many digits, all right? If your device can measure that well, if you have some kind of really good clock, maybe, okay? But then you still have the question of, is that on average? Is that this morning? Was that last week when there was a traffic accident? What are you trying to report with that exactness of that number? And then the last two. I live 57.8 kilometers from school, okay? All of these are good because they've got the number and they also have the unit, okay? The 57.8 number, that seems to be one of the better ones. It's not too precise where you have all these extra digits, okay? And it's not missing a unit like some of the first ones. Okay, and the last one, still a pretty good number. I live 50 minutes to get to school. With that kind of precision, people can still have a ballpark of the amount of time it takes for my drive without getting bogged down by these extra digits which are meaningless because I didn't have an instrument that can measure it that precisely. 
Um, and it still has the unit. All right, so all good measurements must have a number and a unit. If I had just given you the first three statements, how helpful would that be in approximating the amount of time it should take you to get to school? Not very, okay? Same thing with these measurements here. So whenever we're looking at those two different numbers that had a bazillion digits or the ones that were approximately 50 miles, you can only report as many digits as you're actually sure about, all right? So this is the other part about looking at a measurement. If we were to compare these two rulers, what's the difference? It looks like the distance in units is the same, okay, but they're different. The ruler on the bottom has all these additional little increments that can really help us see more precisely where we're measuring. For instance, if I were to draw a line right here, Woo, excuse me, let me erase that. Let's try again. If I draw a line right here, okay? And that line corresponds to the distance of, let's say, a nail. You can see my beautiful artwork taking place right here. All right, so that's our nail head, okay? And if this was, you know, we'll say that this ended up over here at zero, okay? How long would you say that nail is, okay? All right, so you'd go, okay, well, it's at 50. And it's somewhere between 50 and 51. So you might say, all right, it's approximately 50.5. Let's say it's 50.5, okay? That seems like a pretty good number, but we're missing something. What are we missing? Ah, that's right, the unit. So let's say this corresponds with centimeters. Okay, now let's do the same thing down below, All right? Let's draw our line here. Okay. We know it's between 50 and 51, right? Okay, so let's write that number down. But with this ruler, because we have these additional tick marks, we can be more confident in our measurement. Whereas with 50.5, we guessed with the 0.5, now we can say, oh, hey, what do you know? We know it's in between these two tick marks. This first tick mark corresponds with 50.4. This next tick mark corresponds with 50.5. So we know it's between 50.4 and 50.5. So we can come up with our next digit is 50.4, and then we can guess on an additional little one, because we know it's somewhere between four and five, so we can say 50.45 centimeters, okay? So with these, you've got the same nail and a ruler that's measuring them both based on centimeters, but we're able to be more precise with our second measurement because there were more tick marks. Whereas with our first measurement, we were one digit less precise because we didn't have all the individual tick marks in between the numbers to help us locate where our measurement was. All right. So this will help us look and consider what makes a measurement good, what makes it precise, what makes it good. Okay. So you first have to decide, do you have the right tool for the job? And then once you've decided what the right tool is for the measurement, then you can look and see how to report the answer, to report the data that you've collected. All right? So if we look at the definitions of precision and accuracy, let's say we've got this guy that's shooting an arrow at his target. All right? The first time he shoots, you got this first figure here, where all of the arrows are all together, but they're nowhere close to the bullseye. You would say that that target, that shooting range, for that time, you had good precision, but for accuracy. Precision is close agreement in a group of measured numbers. All right, notice how all the arrows in the first figure are really close together, so there's good agreement among them. They all hit about the same spot. But accuracy? Accuracy is the measured value is close to the true value being measured. So the true value in this case, it would be your bullseye, the thing you really want to hit. 
All right. So if this were a bunch of data, that first target would have good precision but poor accuracy. Now let's look at the second target. The second target, you could say it has poor precision, but then you can also say it has poor accuracy. All of the arrows are far apart from each other. They're just sporadically placed. So they're not having a good agreement amongst them about where they landed. Okay? And none of them hit the bullseye, so they're not very accurate either. So you can say that target has poor precision and poor accuracy. Then the last one, hey, look at that. All of the arrowheads and all the arrows are really close to the bullseye. Okay, there's only one that's actually in the red, the rest are all in the yellow, all right? But they're all grouped close together. So you can say that they have good precision and good accuracy. Okay. So why is this helpful? We can think about them and help us treat and think about error, all right? So these are more similar bullseyes. So where you got number one is accurate and precise. Number two is not accurate, but it is precise. Number three is accurate but not precise, and number four is not accurate and not precise. So what we can think about here is error. Where does error come from whenever you're thinking about precision and accuracy? If you have what's called random error, there's an equal probability of being high or low. Meaning, if you've got a person shooting, if they're like me and they've never actually shot an arrow before, I probably have pretty good probability of shooting too high or shooting too low at the target. Why? Because I have poor technique, okay? I haven't been trained in how to shoot an arrow, okay? So I have poor technique, okay? If you think about the Olympics that, that may or may not have just have happened, okay? So whenever you got like the Olympics at Sochi, if you watch those skiers that were coming along and then they had to stop and shoot at the target with their gun, what they had to do is they had to quickly slow their heart rate down that way, even their breathing did not allow their, their shooting to be off target, okay? They were trying to hit these targets from a long distance. So in order to do that, they had to have really good technique that helped reduce their random error as they were shooting at their target, okay? But let's think about what would happen if there were no wind and they were shooting at the same target versus if there were wind, okay? Let's say there was a whole lot of wind that day that the shooter did not account for. And every single shot, let's say it was coming in from the right, going to the left. What would happen to their shots? Their shots could all be skewed to the left. Why? Because that wind was causing their shots to be toward the left. That's what's called systematic error. It's an error that's been weighted due to a cause or a reason that can be determined. With that example, the wind is weighting the shots. It's causing them all to go to the left, okay? So there's not an equal probability of shooting to the right or to the left. It's all going to the left because the wind is causing that error. Okay, whereas random error is the error that you see in, for instance, number four, where all the shots are just kind of scattered around the bullseye, okay? Which of these do you think could have been caused by systematic error? One, two, three? or four? I hope you would have picked number two, okay? With number two, it looks like there's a reason that could have possibly caused that to not be accurate anymore. All of the shots are up and to the right, okay? So it reduced their accuracy, their precision. So most likely that would have been due to systematic error. All right, so as we move on, let's think about two things. What does it mean to be significant, okay, and how do you decide if a number is significant? So as you're making these measurements, you're trying to decide, do I report my distance, say, from my house to Austin P as 50 minutes, or do I report it as 47.627539, et cetera, et cetera, kilometers? How do I decide how many of those units I need to tell a person? If I just add a bunch of digits, does that make my number any more accurate? Or does it mean I'm just adding stuff that may or may not can add to the accuracy? If we think about maybe the, the, the mathematical symbol pi, okay? whenever the mathematicians were first figuring out what pi was, they first started out with three. Okay? So the whole circumference equals two pi r. Okay? They were able to decide that pi was a number that was approximately equal to three. As the years have gone on, they've gone even further, 3.14 then 3.15, 1415, okay? 
and now they've got even more numbers. Why? Because they just added them? Or, which is the correct answer, they figured out more precisely what every additional number is. Okay, so whenever you're looking at a measurement, you have to A, use the right utensil, you then have to report a number, and you also have to report a unit. But more specifically, that number needs to be significant. Okay, so how do we decide if a number is significant or not? All right, so let's look at these examples. The first three, those all seem to be pretty significant. If I have to walk, let's say my car breaks down, one extra mile, plus or minus in either direction, could be pretty significant. It could make me pretty tired, okay? These next three, that I live 35.9718328, all of those seem to be reporting extra numbers that may or may not have been measured accurately, okay? So think about when you're giving these directions, you have to think about how many you report, okay? So, let me forward this slide up a little bit, okay? There are a couple different types of numbers, all right? The first type of number is a non-zero number, all right? So that is all of the numbers that you see here, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, okay? All of them that are not zero considered significant, okay? 10, we're not going to worry about that because that is, woo, let's see what just happened there, okay? Because that is going to be related to our zero. So let's just think about 1 through 9, okay? All of these numbers, if you ever see them reported into a measurement, they're always considered significant, okay? If your number is a zero, sometimes it's significant, okay? And if your number is what's called an exact number, those are 100% infinitely significant, okay? What I mean by that? If I were to ask you how many toes do you have, you can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and I don't know what's happened to my PowerPoint slide there. So you can count all your toes, and you know that they're significant. It's not like you have 9.999 and nine toes. You have either have ten or you have nine, okay? You have an exact number of toes, okay? So, for instance, let's list an example number here. So let's do 20. 7.35580. And let's say this is our number. We're trying to figure out which of those numbers in that 27.35080 are significant. Okay. So, first of all, any non zero integers are always count, meaning they're always significant. Okay, so if we come up here, 2, is it significant? Yes, it's got to be significant. Why? Because it's not a 0. What about the 7? Is it significant? Yes. Okay, same for the 3, the 5, and the 8. Those are all significant just based on the first rule, that if it's not 0, it is always significant. Okay? Number three doesn't really apply to this, exact numbers, okay? If you didn't obtain them by measuring, if you know them by definition, or if it comes from a table in a book, or you counted your toes, then all of the numbers are always they're infinitely significant, okay? We'll talk more about what that means in a little bit. But this number, let's say, was made by measuring. So we have to figure out which of those numbers are significant. Okay, leading zeros. Leading zeros are any zeros that you put in front of the number. All right, let's say I add a zero in front of this two. Did I just change that number? Is 027.35080 different than 27.35080? No, it's not different at all, okay? So that zero is what's called a leading zero. But they're not significant because by putting them in front of a number, you're not changing the number in the slightest. So it is not significant, okay? Captive zeros. Captive zeros are what I call the middle guys. They're anything that is contained between two non-zero integers. So in our example number at the top here, the captive zeros would be this zero right here, okay? Because that zero is between a five and it's between an eight. So it's what's called a captive zero. So we can see that to be significant. 
Okay. And our last zero, when we're looking at that zero, sorry, my handwriting's bad. Okay, when we're looking at that last zero, that last zero is called a trailing zero. Okay. That trailing zero. So leading zeros are never significant. Captive zeros are always significant. And trailing zeros sometimes are significant, sometimes they're not. Okay? If there is a decimal present, then they are significant. Okay? If a decimal is not present, then it is not significant, unless you indicate it by a line below the zero. Okay? So in this case, is there a decimal present? Since there is a decimal present, it is significant. Okay. Let's look at a, a couple more examples of this. Okay, so let's say we have the number 350. All right, the first two numbers, those are both significant because they are integers and they're non-zero integers. But that last zero, what is it? Is it a leading zero? No. Is it a captive zero? a trailing zero. So since it's trailing and it's at the end, we have to ask the question, is there a decimal present? No, there's not. Since there is not a decimal present, it is not significant. Okay? If there were a decimal present, as in 350 point, by adding that zero, it just became significant. I mean, adding that decimal, we just made that zero significant. Or we could have also written this number as 350 with a line under it, and that would also make it significant. Okay, so these are kind of the three examples of trailing zeros, where the first case is, and the last two, is where a decimal is present or a line's under it makes it significant. Okay, so let's look more, a little bit closer, at exact numbers. So these are all examples of exact numbers. Basically, whenever you're doing any kind of mathematics or any kind of uh, sig figs question, these you never look at for determining sig figs. Because if you look at this number, say the one kilometer equals 0 0.6214, there are four sig figs in that number. But there's one sig fig and one kilometer, so which one has more? If one kilometer equals 0 0.6214 miles, are there four significant digits in the one? because there's four in the other side of the equation. If they're equal, they should have the same number of sig figs. That's actually not a good question to ask. The one is infinitely significant. You could represent that as 1.0000, et cetera, et cetera. And then same thing with the mile, okay? Is you could just keep on adding zeros onto it and keep it infinitely significant. So the rule is anything that comes from a table like this even though you've got, say, four sig figs in this number, two sig, three sig figs in that number, they're still considered infinitely significant. So as far as sig figs go, you don't give them a number of sig figs. You just simply say they're infinitely significant, and you disregard them for mathematical purposes. Okay? We'll get into that a little bit later whenever we talk about the mathematics that are involved in chemistry. All right, so let's talk about uncertainty and measurement. Whenever we looked at the ruler, the two different unit scales of that ruler, we looked at this without really knowing what we were looking at. All right, so uncertainty and measurement. The number of digits reported in any measurement reflect both the accuracy of the measurement and the precision of the measuring device. All of the figures are known with certainty plus one extra figure, okay? And that's called a significant figure. All of them are. So whenever we were measuring the ruler, we figured out what it was between, okay? So we said, oh, the nail is between these two numbers, and then we guessed what number it was in between the two tick marks. That's the way you always make a measurement, is you figure out what you know for certain, plus you add one more guess, one more guessing figure, and then all the numbers that you write down are considered significant, okay? And the reason we do this is it helps us figure out both accuracy and precision. So, whenever we're measuring a bacteria, can we say, oh, two centimeters, that's good enough? Or do we need more digits to really figure out how big that bacteria is? And I would say yes. And so that's what you have to make sure you have the unit and you have the number that's reported with the correct accuracy 
and the correct precision. Okay, so let's look at some examples of how to make these measurements. All right, so this is one ruler as an example. So we've got from zero up to five centimeters. All right, think about this. Which numbers do you know for sure the nail is between? We know that it's between four and five centimeters. Okay, now those are the numbers that we know for sure. So we know our number has to start with four point something, okay? We know it's between four and five. We don't know it's 4.1. We don't know if it's 4.2. We don't know if it's 4.3, okay? Those would all be guesses. So you write down what you know for sure, and then you give it one digit that is a guess. So on this one, I'm gonna guess it's about 4.3 centimeters. Okay, and that would be a good answer. Let's see what other good possible answers are, okay? 4.2 centimeters, 4.3 centimeters, 4.4 centimeters. Notice 4.9 centimeters is on here. Why? Because where it's at is significantly from where 4.9 would be, okay? But notice each one of these answers has two sig figs, okay? They also have a unit. If you look at unacceptable answers, that would be 4.2. Why is that one wrong? It's got the right number of sig figs, but it's missing the unit. Okay. 4.30, why is that one wrong? It's the same thing as 4.3 and 4.30. Aren't those the same thing? No, not at all. Okay, because here you guessed on one number with the 4.3. That's your guess. With 4.30, you have two guesses, okay? And you can't have two guesses when reporting measurements. You can only have one number that is a guess, okay? And with four centimeters, you don't have any guesses, okay? So those would be what's called unacceptable answers. Okay. All right, what about this ruler? It's very similar to the other one, okay? But what's different? We have additional tick marks, okay? Let me zoom in on it a little bit. All right. Take a minute, write down on your piece of paper what you think an answer would be, a good answer would be. All right, so let's think about it. The first thing we know, once again, is it's between four and five. So let's write four down. Okay. The next thing we know is if we look at this line, we continue that line up, what numbers is it between? See, this would be 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, and 4.4 would be that tick mark. So it's between 4.3 and 4.4. So we know it has to be at least 4.3. Okay, now comes your guess number. All right, because you can't know for certain that it's 4.35. You can't know for certain it's 4.36. That five, that six, those are your guess number. So on this one, I'm gonna guess 4.3, six centimeters, and that will be my guess. Let's look at some more acceptable answers. 4.35 centimeters, 4.36 centimeters, 4.37 centimeters, 4.38 centimeters, 4.39 centimeters, all right? All of these would be acceptable answers. Unacceptable answers would include 4.3. Why is 4.3 wrong? Two reasons. It doesn't have the right number of sig figs, all right? It's missing its guess unit. Additionally, it's missing the unit, so it's wrong for that reason. It doesn't have centimeters. 4.3 centimeters is wrong because of our sig figs. 4 centimeters is wrong because of sig figs. 4.377, that's wrong for two reasons. One, well, it's actually okay for that reason, but it has too many sig figs on there, okay? So it's a little high, but it's fine. And then it's got one too many sig figs, which means it has two guesses instead of the one it should have had, okay? And 4.10 centimeters, why that's wrong? is because 4.1 would show up right here, okay? And we can tell that that nail is much longer than 4.1 centimeters. 
So not only do you have to use your ruler right, you gotta report the right numbers, the right per number of numbers, and the right unit. Okay. And all of this is what's involved in making a correct measurement. All right, so I want us to do is a little bit more practice. So work along with me. If you need to pause the video at any point in order to take a little bit more time writing down what your answer is, feel free. Okay. But write down your, your answer on the piece of paper, and remember you have to include a number and a unit for each of the following. Okay. All right. This first measurement that we're going to take is going to involve reading a meniscus. All right. A meniscus is what you see where you've got this kind of curved line. Now, why in the world do you have a curved line? Well, we'll get to it in a lot more detail later on. But for right now, let's look at these examples of mercury and of water. All right. Mercury has a curved meniscus that's going upside down, kind of. Okay. Whereas water has a meniscus that's curving like that. The reason for that is it's because of what occur and intramolecular forces, adhesion and cohesion. Mercury likes itself a lot more than it likes the sides of the tube. Since it likes itself a whole lot, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of elitist, I guess you could say. It's gonna hang on to itself preferentially as opposed to the sides of the, the wall of the tube. So if it can ever attach to itself as opposed to the tube, it will. And that's what happens at the end of every mercury column is you get this nice pretty bubble that comes and rises higher than the rest of the, of the sample. Whereas water is the opposite. It likes the glass tube more than it likes itself. So it's gonna creep up the sides of the tube just so it can be closer to, to the glass tube than it is to itself of the water, okay? So whenever you're reading any kind of liquid apparatus, what you wanna do is you wanna get down and you wanna really get eye level with it, all right? You wanna get down right even with it. Move, you can move the instrument, raise or lower it, but you wanna get down so you can see exactly the end, the very tip of the meniscus, okay? That tip of the meniscus is what you're measuring. You are not measuring up high, okay? You don't measure the tip. That would be wrong. All right, you wanna measure the very bottom of it. Why it's important to get in line with the tip is because if you raise up and you measure, you look downward on your sample, you're always gonna read the volume lower than it truly is. Whereas if you come from up high, or from low, you look up high, you're always gonna end up with a number that's higher than the true value. Okay? So kind of two rules in reading a meniscus. Get down to your eye level with the bottom part of the meniscus and read the bottom of the meniscus, or the tip, I guess we would say, as opposed to these edges that creep up. Okay? If you were to be looking at the mercury column, which has that shape that forms a bubble, your meniscus is still that tip, so you'd want to measure the top part of the bubble. Okay. So let's do an example of this. This instrument that you see zoomed in is called a burette. So the way a burette works is it starts here at zero, okay, and it goes down. In this example, it's written as 25. A lot of the ones that we have in the lab here are, they go to 50, okay, but the units are in milliliters. So what you want to do is you want to read them exactly the same way that you are reading a ruler, all right? You figure out what numbers it's between, okay? Then you keep on zooming in, okay? So if this number here is 42, what would this number be? 42.1, 42. Point two, forty-three point three. Oh, sorry, forty-two point three, forty-two point four, and then forty-two point five. Okay, so you're not you're doing the exact same thing you did with the ruler. Is you're paying attention to what unit it's between. Okay. Doesn't matter what number's up high, it doesn't matter what number's down low, you just wanna figure out which direction the tick marks are going. Label every tick mark so you can see exactly how accurate it is, and then figure out which numbers it's between. So for instance, my measurement 
should be right about here. If I were to outline the measurement, that's where it's at. Okay. So that means I know for sure that my measurement is between those two tick marks. What do those two tick marks represent? One was 42.2 and one was 42.3. So I know my number has to be between 42.2 and 42.3. So 42.2, is that my answer? No. So we got to have one number that is a guess. Okay, so 42 point, it looks like about three to me. And then you also have to make sure to write your units. Okay. And 42.23 milliliters. On this one, I would say 42.22 milliliters, 42.25 or 26 milliliters would actually be acceptable as well. But the main thing you want to notice is how many decimal places are being reported in your answer. Okay. All right, try the next one on your own. This is of a graduated cylinder, so it looks like this. Okay. We've got two differences here with the grad with the burette. Burettes are marked with what's called a T D, which is considered to dispense, meaning the volume that you're recording is the volume that you're going to dispense. Whereas a graduated cylinder is meant to contain liquids, so they're marked with a TC, which is to contain. All right. So anytime you're measuring a volume in a graduated cylinder, you're seeing how much volume is contained within that instrument. And that's why it starts at zero at the bottom and it goes up to 100. Okay. And the units, once again, are milliliters. All right. So if this is a close-up of this beer, of this graduated cylinder, excuse me, tell me what is the final measurement that you can report. Pause the video right now if you need to. All right, so let's go on then. Here is the meniscus. That is what you're measuring. Okay. We know 50 is down here. 50.5 is here. Okay, 50.6 is here, and 50, whoa, sorry, I erased that, let me, let me start that over. All right, there, I just assumed they were all going up by one, but if this is 50, and this is 60, what do I need to do instead? 50? 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, and 60. That makes sense. Okay. So now we can ask ourselves, what numbers is it between? Okay. To me, it kind of looks like it's right on the edge. Okay. Right around 56. So I'm going to say I know for sure it's between 57 and 56, okay? So I'm going to write down 56 point, okay? Now, I can either say point zero, where zero is my guess, okay? I also could have said 55.9, where nine was my guess. Okay, you got to put your units down. Of milliliters. Okay, so on this one, really 55.9 milliliters all the way probably to 56.1 milliliters would be acceptable. All right, but once again, you have to look and you have to see that you have the correct number of decimal places, the correct number of significant figures. Okay. All right, give this one a try. Feel free. So this is 7, and this is 8, and our units are millimeters, okay? So that means every tick mark is a tenth, so 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, okay? And it looks like it's between 8.2 and 8.3, so my answer on this one would be 8.25 millimeters.
Once again, there's a range of acceptable answers, 8.23, probably to 8.27 or 28. But the important thing is, is you need to have two decimal places for a total of three significant figures. All right, give this one a try. Okay. So there's our seven. Mm -hmm. Our units, does this look like a graduated cylinder? What does it look like? Okay, to me, it looks like a graduated cylinder. So our units are going to once again be milliliters. Okay. Our meniscus is here. Six point two is this number. Six point four. Six point six, six point eight, and then seven point zero. Okay. With these ones, these are a little bit trickier because you're not guessing exactly between six six and six seven. Okay. So you're actually guessing instead, is this around 6.7? What's going on there? Okay. So you know for sure it's at between 6.6 .6 and 6.8. Okay. But your guess is still going to be that it's 6.7. Okay. Because you're still guessing on that last number. You're not sure. Okay. You're not sure if it's 6.65. 670, okay, so 6.7 milliliters will be my answer on that one. Okay, all right, give this one a try. All right, so what numbers do I know it's between? I know it's between three. 3.2 and 3.3, .3. so I'm going to guess 3.29, and is that going to be milliliters or centimeters? Okay, it depends, right? You could have written 3.29 centimeters, okay, or you could have also written 32.9 millimeters, okay, just because every tick mark is a millimeter. So each one of those is a millimeter, and every one of these bigger tick marks is a centimeter. Okay? So if you were to count up the individual tick marks, there are 10 millimeters in every one centimeter, which means here's 10, here's 10, here's 10. So up until this point, here are 30 millimeters plus 1 plus 2. So that's where we get the 32 from, 32.9 millimeters. But either of these would be acceptable. All right, let's recap a little bit. At the end of every lesson, I plan to have these lesson recaps for you. There are more lessons than what you'll see in these lesson recaps, but I hope that they'll kind of remind you of what was in that lecture. So you must choose the appropriate measuring device for the system you are studying. You must report a unit and a number for every measurement taken. If you have a measurement that's either missing a unit or it's missing a number, then guess what? It's not helpful. Okay, you want to report your measurements as precisely and as accurately as your measuring device allows. Okay. No point in adding extra decimal points if you cannot add them. And if you left some off, then you need to take care of that and make sure you include all the ones that you should have added as well. The number of digits reported in an answer are called the significant digits of the answer, or sig figs. Sometimes you'll hear me call it significant figures, sometimes significant digits. It's the same thing, okay? And then additionally, there are rules for identifying sig figs. So you've got your non-zero non integers, which are always significant, your numbers that come from a table, which are exact numbers, those are infinitely significant, and then your zeros. Okay, you got your leading zeros, your captive zeros, and your trailing zeros. And you need to learn to differentiate between all of them and determine which one are significant and which ones are not.